All right. We're in a series, part three of today's called This Is War. Yeah. Can you say it? This is war. This is war. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 6, which is our banner scripture. Uh, and this is uh, the most developed discussion of spiritual warfare, I believe, in all the New Testament. Paul's writing here to the church in Ephesus. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. How many know the devil's a schemer? OK, the way in which he comes in is through our mind, puts thoughts, casts thoughts into our minds to really get us to tempt us. That's what the enemy does. Matthew chapter four. Verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights after he was hungry, now then, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle, or the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Uh, the focus for today and the title of the third installment of This is War is Overcoming Temptation. Overcoming Temptation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we know your presence is here. And where your presence is, is, Lord, there is liberty, there's joy, there's freedom. We also know, Lord, in your presence you speak to us. So, Father, we just pray every single person's heart's ready to receive, every ear is ready to hear, every mind is ready to be renewed, every life is ready to be changed. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to uh, reveal to us today in Scripture and the authority in which we have because of Jesus Christ. We give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to uh, greet a happy birthday to our officer, uh, Officer Santana, celebrating his 50th birthday. He didn't even look 50, right? But <laughs> congratulations. And then welcome back, Sister Faye. She came back from her mission trip or her work in the Philippines, LHC and TK. Uh, great work there, uh, there overseas. Now, everybody say temptation. 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 It's a common experience. It's not unique to any individual. All of us are tempted by something. We may not be tempted by the same thing, but each person is, be, is tempted by something. Every one of us is a rather complicated um, combination of competing appetites and desires, both good and bad, that are looking to, for satisfaction. That's why Paul encourages the church in Galatia. He tells them to walk by the Spirit, and by doing so, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh is contrary to the Spirit's desire, and the Spirit's desire is contrary to the flesh. Both are at war with one another. They're at conflict. And every single day, we decide if we're going to be led by the Spirit or we're going to be ruled by our flesh. And if we're ruled by our flesh all the time, then probably all the time we fall in temptation. And the reason why is because our flesh is easily tempted. That's why Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 41, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, how many of you know that life is full of temptations? Amen. How many are just tempted on the way up here? I mean. Some people were just tempted on just going off on somebody, like especially if you're on 1604 and some church traffic, right? You're tempted. Some people are tempted to be ultra sensitive, to be all up in their feelings. They can't wait for somebody to get the feelings hurt so they can go off on that person. Some people are tempted to be in a state of laziness. How many of you feel like you do that sometimes? Like you're always tempted just to be lazy. Like, do I need to even get up? Do I even need to shower? Like... Anybody retired here today? Retired people? All retired people? I know, uh, I know I heard someone say to their husband, they said, you know, just because you're retired doesn't mean that you need to sit all day on the couch eating pork rinds and <laughs> watching telenovel telenovelas, right? Or like soap operas or prices, right? Or Judge Judy, right? But this is what's his response. He goes, I'm not lazy. 
He said, I'm just highly motivated to do nothing. <laughs> but there are some people here who were tempted to steal. Uh, maybe sometimes they're tempted to covet, tempted to compare yourself with one another, tempted to lust after somebody else's spouse or somebody else not your spouse, tempted to overeat, tempted to overindulge, or tempted to overspend. Like this couple who uh, got in an argument because uh, they had purchased a house they really couldn't afford, and so they're trying to make ends meet. So they decided to go shopping, and uh, the husband instructs the wife. He goes, okay, uh, I want to tell you we're on a budget, so you cannot spend more than $50. So they both were in agreement. They separated to go to their preferred shops, uh, to, uh, stores to shop. So the husband meets back up with his wife, and she's wearing a brand-new dress, and it's a dress that looks very expensive. So she looks at her husband. She says, you know what? I realized uh, that you told, uh, told me that we could only spend 50 more, no more than $50, but I had to spend $500. And the husband says, what? Why did you have to spend $500? And then she says, well, I was just walking, and I looked at the store, and in the window, there was this beautiful dress, and it was $500. And I knew I couldn't buy it, but I had to try it on. And I tried it on, and it was like the moment I saw myself in the dress, is like Satan said to me, you look stunning in that dress. And he's whispering in my ear, and he told me that I deserve this, and I've earned this, so I bought it. And he goes, honey, this is what I do when I'm tempted by the enemy. I say, Satan, you're a thief and you're a liar. You should have told Satan he's a liar. She's like, excuse me? You tell me I don't look good in this dress? <laughs> then he goes, no, 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 that's what I'm saying. He goes... All right, here's what I do when I'm tempted. I say, Satan, get behind me. So she says, I said that. I said, Satan, get behind me. And you know what he said to me? He said, girl, you look good from behind too. <laughs> so I had to buy it. How many know it sure doesn't help knowing we're, we're easily tempted, or some of us are easily tempted, that there's a tempter who's tempting us? And every single person is tempted. Jesus himself is no stranger to temptation. His public ministry, in fact, began and ended with temptation. The moment that he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit of God led him to the wilderness so he could be tempted. Without even the enemy realizing through that temptation, he would then be strengthened for his public ministry. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, towards the end of his public ministry, he is then tempted with his personal struggle of his divine purpose here on this earth, of walking away from it, that's why he prays to God, if there be another way, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But thanks be to God that he resisted that temptation. Amen? I said thanks be to God that he resisted that temptation. Hey, and temptation is real. How many of you know that? It's very real, and the struggle is real. Temptation's bigger than me, but it's not bigger than him. And the fact that he overcame temptation is, is proof positive, not of the reality of temptation, but the reality of victory that we have over temptation. That the Spirit of God that was living in the inside of Jesus, that was residing in him, overcame temptation. That Spirit still lives on the inside of us. And the fact that he overcame it means we can overcome it too, in Jesus' name. That's why the enemy can't overpower us. Because he's been defeated, but he sure can't outwit us. He can't make us eat the fruit, but he sure does make it look good, doesn't he? 1 Peter 5, verse 8 through 9 says, be sober. Everybody say, be sober. It means be able to discern. Be vigilant. Stand your ground. Because your adversary, the devil, again, the word the de devil is the Greek word diablos, which means somebody who constantly hurls, habitually hurls lies insults at you, trying to penetrate in your mind. And it says, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom, notice it's whom, it's contingent on the person, means not everybody's going to be devoured. It says, who he may, everybody say may. It doesn't say he can devour. May speaks of permission, can speaks of ability. He doesn't have the ability unless you give him the permission. And it says, who he may devour. Notice it didn't say whom he may lick or whom he may snack on. He'll straight up devour you, that if he can tempt you and pull you and draw you away from God, he's going to devour you, devour you so much and consume you so much that there's nothing left of you. That's his whole intent and purpose. And Matthew 4 verse 1 says that the Spirit of God led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by him. 
Now, when you hear that, you're thinking, what in the world? Why, why would Jesus even need to be near Satan, somebody who is looking to devour? So there are four, four, four points I just want to, and very simple uh, to points to br- bring up today uh, on our message, Overcoming Temptation, is I want you to know this is number one, God cannot tempt us. Everybody say that. God cannot tempt me. Okay? It is complete, uh, absolutely impossible for God to tempt us with evil. He can't lead people into sin because he doesn't even want to be around sin. He deals with sin, but he, doesn't, he won't lead you into sin. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He's long-suffering. He's abounding in goodness and truth. The Lord is good and his mercies endure forever and his compassion showers over all his creation. And the good news is that he has not changed, he will not change, and he'll never change. God will always be good. And it's not that he just does good things. The Bible says that he is good. He does good things because he is good. There's no evil in him. And there's nothing about God that could be around sin. So there's nothing about God or in God that could tempt us with sin or tempt us with evil. He loves you. He hates sin, but he loves you. And if he loves you, why would he drive you into something that he hates? He wouldn't do that. James 1 verse 13 through 15 says, when tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Does that sound like something God would do? No. The Bible says that God works all things together for the good. Right. He works all things together. He doesn't cause all things, but he works all things. So temptation is God himself is not the source of the temptation, but he can use that for something else. And here, here's what we should know. God can't tempt us, but he can test us. God can and does test us. God can't tempt you with evil. But do you think he would lead you into a trial or a test? Yes. How many feel like you're in one right now? Like you just feel like you're in a testing period right now. Right. How many feel like, you know, you're sitting next to that test, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, man, you made it worse. <laughs> but here's why he tests us. It says in James 1, 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Have you ever felt that way? The moment you feel like you're being tested and you're being tried, you're like, whoo-hoo, yeah! We don't usually say that, right? But it says, consider it pure joy because you know that the testing of your faith is what happens. It produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So I know I had teachers growing up in high school where you come back from the winter break and they give you a pop quiz. Like, I, don't, I didn't like taking tests. But here's the thing that you should be excited about when it comes to taking tests is if you're taking a test, that means that you're up for promotion, That's what that means. So your ability to pass the test will then determine if you can advance or you got to repeat. But nonetheless, God does test. And here's why he tests, because it produces something in us. It's called perseverance. When perseverance is, that just means the stability of your faith. And when that happens, you have when perseverance does its full work, then you become you become uh, the Bible says mature and complete. Mature means you can stand firm. Complete means a whole means that you have everything lacking nothing. So it means that when you, you and, and you could see the difference, like when someone's a new believer and then when someone who's been a strong believer for years, there are things that happen to this new believer that rattles them, that if it happened to this, the, the seasoned one, it doesn't rattle them. Why is that? Because they've been through some things and they've persevered through the, some things. Pastor Joe was gone on a mission trip and something happened here at the church And I remember he wrote me this long text and I read it. And it was almost like I was, I'm not reading gospel. I mean, it's filled with scripture, but it was so eloquent and so seasoned that my wife read it and she said, I want to be able to write like that. And I said, you can't write like that unless you've been through that. And you can see that through people, things that you've gone through. Here's the beauty of it. When you go through things, you know what? You always come out stronger. The Bible says when Jesus was tempted, that Satan left him, and then all the angels ministered to him. And then the Bible says that he was full of the power of God. 
Because that's what happens after a test. Because you feel depleted, right? Like you feel like, well, I'm weak, I'm weak, I can't do this anymore. Like you want to quit. But then when you get through it, you persevere. All of a sudden, this supernatural strength came back in you. What, what happened? You went through some things, you persevered, you've been, you're being matured, and you're being complete in Christ Jesus. And the testing of your faith produces that perseverance. And when God leads you into a test, you'll find that this is what he'll do. He'll draw you out of areas of comfort and convenience, and he'll challenge you to be more than what you've been before, to think different, to act different, to live different, to speak different, and to have a completely different approach to what God has called you to do here on this earth. And it's for your benefit. He loves you. He develops you. And because of that, he tests you. But us parents, we can relate with that. Like, don't, don't we agree that sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll inflict a little discomfort on our kids to challenge them, to, to really go out and be, be more than where they are right now? I mean, just even, we don't just let our kids just do whatever they want. Like, anybody ever try waking up your kids in the morning for school when they don't want to wake up? And then when they ask you if they can skip school, you say, no, you can skip to school, but you're not skipping school, right? <laughs> But how many you know we'll, we'll inflict a little discomfort for them to get them out of bed so they can go to school so they can learn, and at school they're always tested too, right? Now, I don't know if you have kids like, like mine. Sometimes they get up on time. Sometimes it's a struggle, right, because our kids like sleeping. And uh, I don't know if you, you do this like I do it. And I think this is good parenting practice, uh, best practice for parents who are trying to get the kids in the morning. If our kids don't wake up, we start removing blankets. <laughs> And if that doesn't work, we kind of you know, gently shake them. If they don't wake up, this is kind of like the, the red button we hit. This is like the, the emergency button, and that emergency button is me singing to them. <laughs> so I'll sing to them, you got to get up. You got to get going. You're going to learn new things today. So get up out of bed and go wash your head and brush your teeth because your breath smells a little bit stinky. dun 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 All right, you're laughing, but my kids don't laugh. They do not like that. In fact, we start doing that, and if they know that button's about to be pressed, they get up and they say, Daddy, please don't sing. <laughs> I mean, they know it's coming. <laughs> but us parents will inflict a little pain and misery and gloom on their life because you hope that one day that they're going to graduate and eventually they'll pay their own bills. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Miles. Your parents are rich. All right. But you send them to school. Why? So they can learn. And then what happens at school is they're tested to ensure that what they're learning, they're comprehending, and it's really getting in them. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test, or in other words, have passed. That person will receive the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. Notice it says, blessed is the man who perseveres the trials, not blessed is the man who experiences the trials. Because each one of us are going to experience trials whether we want it or not. It just depends on how we perceive what we're experiencing and if we're going to quit or if we're going to persevere. And blessed is the one who perseveres. It's not the trial that brings the blessing. It's the perseverance of the trial that brings the blessing. And we have a choice in the outcome of of how we, how, we, how we get on the other side and what that looks like for us. We get to make that choice. It's much like um, with faith being worked out. It's like uh, going to work out at the gym. Anybody gym member? Uh, you have a membership at a gym here? Like, anybody like working out? Let me see that hand. You love working out. Okay. Well, there's quite a few people. Nobody raised their hand for a service. Yeah. So uh, how many of you know that if you've ever, uh, I don't know if you just have ever done this, have you ever gone to the gym and not work out? Like you showed up, but you didn't do anything, right? Like you walk in, you see the leg machines, the bench press machine, ooh, vending machine, and then you go to the vending machine, you grab a Snickers bar and a soda, and you sit down and watch other people work out. And how many ever watch somebody work out and you get tired? You're like, oh man, woo, what a day, what a day. And you get up, walk away. How many of you know uh, you're not going to do it? Nothing's going to happen to you if you keep doing that. You won't get stronger. In fact, on Tuesday this week, I run into Pastor Michelle, who's here today, and her husband, Pastor John Jones, they're former associate pastors. And every time we see each other, we usually talk a lot. Uh, but this time, on Tuesday, it was an extended time. Like, I was just getting the workout in. I just got there. 
Pastor John comes, and we both lean up against the incline bench, and we talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> Everybody's working out around a lot of things, and then we look at their watch. We say, oh, man, I got to go. He said, well, good workout. See you next week. And we took off. How many know it's not me just leaning on the weights is going to make me stronger or being around weights is going to make me stronger. It's what I do with those weights that I got to exert energy and push it and press it. And, and then what happens is then my, 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 my muscles then break down only to be built back up through some rest. And that's what happens when we are tested is that our faith begins. It feels like it doesn't it feel like you're being broken down, like you just feel that you can't go anymore. But the moment it's lifted and you pass, all of a sudden you're extra strong. So some of you are like this in the spirit. Some of you are like, what's going on? Like, uh, I don't know what's happening. I'm like, but it's the test, the test that God brings in our lives that allows us to increase our faith and to grow our faith and allow us to persevere. First Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, for faith to be genuine, it must be tested. The ultimate measure of your faith is not how you stand, in moments of comfort and convenience, but how you stand in moments of adversity and challenges. Tests will reveal where you are and if you repeat or if you proceed. Promotion. So we know God doesn't test us. He can't tempt us, but he does test. Excuse me. God can't tempt us, but he does test us. So therefore, number three, we have to understand that Satan will tempt us. Not that he might. He straight up will tempt you. Matthew 4, 3, this is what... Our scripture, we're just reading Jesus being tempted. The Bible refers to him not as Satan, but as the tempter. It says, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, command these uh, stones become bread. First Thessalonians 3 verse 5 says, for this reason, when I could not stand, stand it no longer, I sent to you, excuse me, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. So listen, if you're being tempted, that person is prompting you to fail with the attempt to destroy you. But when you're being tested, that person is prompting you to succeed in order to grow you. So Satan's our devourer. He's looking to destroy. God gives life and gives it more abundantly. His desires for you to grow. So testing and trials are meant to bring us closer to God, and temptation is meant to draw us away from God. Now, uh, show your hands real quick, if we can be honest, how many were just tempted this morning in some, some area, right? Okay. Can you raise your hand? Like, like be proud. No, I'm saying don't be proud. <laughs> don't even be proud about it. I'm just teasing. Here's the thing. Some people feel bad when they're tempted. But temptation is not a sin. It's an opportunity to sin. It's not the bait. It's the bite that's the sin. Because if Jesus himself was tempted and yet he was without sin, that means to be tempted is not a sin. It's to act on it that makes it the sin. In Hebrews 4.15, and here's, here's, here's why it's so important that Jesus was tempted on all points. Because it says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points and were in every way tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here's the beauty of Jesus being tempted as we are, is that there's nothing that we get tempted by or nothing that we fall into that Jesus cannot relate with. He can sympathize with us. And the fact is, is that he overcame the temptation. And here's the good news about that, is if you struggle in that area or struggle with that temptation, here's what you got to do. Ask somebody who's overcome it. You know who's overcome it? Jesus has overcome it. And you're saying, Jesus, help me. That should be a prayer for everybody. Jesus, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Depends how often you get tempted. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Help me, help me. Jesus, help me. The Bible says that we are tempted and enticed by our own desire. Temptation is the idea of, of bait and drawing out fish from their retreat. And then the moment that they get the bait, then he's got them hooked. And that's what Satan does. And, and here's the thing. If that bait that he's giving you doesn't work, then he tries something else. Because uh, not only does your spouse know your weakness or your family knows your weakness, uh, if Satan hasn't discovered it, he'll discover it. 
So what does he do? He keeps putting bait out there to see what you'll bite on. And if you bite on it, guess what he'll do? He'll keep putting that bait out to get you hooked. And um, one time I was, uh, when I was young, you know, we we're thinking, talking about just things that attempted. One thing that I tell my wife, because uh, it's, it, it's difficult for men, uh, I would say, because I'm a man. I'm speaking on behalf of men. I understand men, because I am one, right? <laughs> It's a challenge for men, even keeping, keeping their eyes pure before the Lord and, and having covenant. Like I tell my wife, I'm covenant with you. When I say that, I mean my eyes too. And, um, you know, you go to the gym, you go someplace, like it's, it can be difficult for men to not get, take the bait and not just to look and start to imagine things. And um, I remember one time, Pastor John, when I was in high school, Pastor John came, he preached here at the time he was pastoring Harvest, harvest Time. And uh, he had said, he had said, there's a, a single look and a double look. He said, the single look is you acknowledge somebody's attractive. He said, the problem happens is when you do the single and you follow it up with the double. <laughs> he said, that's when you start imagining things and you're falling into temptation. So I, I, that stuck with me growing up as a, a young man. And then when I started pastoring the youth, I would always give that illustration. And then one of the youth says, well, if we can't do a double look, can we just do one long single look? <laughs> I'm like, you're missing the point here, right? <laughs> so here's what I do. If, if, if there's, and my wife will ask me, do I think anybody is attractive? Or, and I said, I've acknowledged that there are people who, who are, are pretty, you know, other women. Um, but I said that I, by the grace of God, I said I, I, try to, I do the best that I can with the help of the Holy Spirit to keep my covenant with you. That, that I said that will last as long as we both shall live, and I'm not going to look at anybody let my heart be drawn away from you. So that's my covenant with her. And uh, so this is what I do. If there's someone who's, who's attractive and pretty, and they walk by me, and this is all I do to them. <laughs> no, it's good. I don't, I don't do that. I, don't get I know that caught you all off guard. Right? <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. No, but, but here, here's, here's, really what I, here's really what I do. If that happens and then I see the person, you know what I do? I just actually walk the other way. That's all I do. I just walk the other way. Did you realize that sometimes it's just wisdom? You know, that's it. The same way you got yourself into the predic predicament you're in is the same way you can get out. You got in there with your feet, you can get back out with your feet, right? That's all you got to do. So uh, I know it's harder than, than, than that for, for a lot of it. There's some real struggles that we, we do have. Um, but I just know this. If, if alcohol is something you struggle with, uh, you should stay away from bars. Don't even go to a bar. Don't order a drink and don't put it in your hand and say, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. <laughs> like I know we have a lot of young, young, young couples here who aren't married yet. And what we tell them is, listen, if... Um, you know, if you are struggling because they'll fall into sexual sin, I said, well, how do you get there? And a lot of times is that they go to a place by themselves, and then that's when it happens. I said, well, stop going there, right? It seems simple, right? It's just wisdom sometimes. And, you know, when it comes, uh, I was going to touch on this, that Satan's desire is always to pull us away from the faith, to draw us away from God. And one of the things that we were talking about at first service I don't know why I went there, but I went there, but I'm going to go there, is we're talking about alcohol. And so somebody asked me once, like, what are our stances on alcohol, and do I drink? And I would just say this, that I started drinking about 17 years old, and I stopped drinking at 21. Just that seems like that's not how it's supposed to work, right? Because um, one of the reasons is why I, I don't care for alcohol much is because I see what it does to people who abuse it and what it does to families. And one of the things that happened, when I turned 21 on my birthday, I was at, uh, uh, it was called uh, Bamsi, but now Samsi. My father was just getting a, his gallbladder removed, and he's had like 20 some operations, and this was like one of the, the few. And um, the doctors had told us that they discovered something else. My father had cirrhosis of the liver. It was so hardened that they only gave him five years to live. And my father was a hard drinker. I mean, he was like tequila every Wednesday, every night, every Friday, because we'd have parties. All the all his Marine friends would come over, and that's all I just remember: tequila and lumpia. That's like the whole party, right? <laughs> lumpia is a Filipino egg roll. Is really what that was. And uh, 
When the moment I heard that, they said, my dad's got five years left to live. I just made a decision. I'm putting that down, and I might even put myself in that situation because I do know that, and Pastor Jeff and I were talking because he was telling me he had like three shots the other day, and uh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he might come in right now. I'm seeing if I have his attention. But, you know, when I did drink, I would drink like three Jack Daniel, just straight up shots, and it wouldn't do anything to me. And um, they were shocked because they said, are you not at least a little buzzed or anything? I said, no, I mean, I feel good. Like, I feel like I'm just drinking water. But the thing about it is, because the enemy knows, you know, look at my father and what it did to his liver. And imagine, for me, I don't even get the taste or the effects of it, how much I have to do to get it in my system and what I would do to my liver. And uh, that's the conviction I have for myself. But I, uh, other people ask me, well, can I drink? And can I drink around you? And I'm like, you know what? I, I really, honestly, it doesn't offend me at all. Uh, alcohol doesn't offend me. The Bible does say, doesn't say I can't find a specific, a clear scripture that says we cannot drink. It just says do not be drunk with wine. And the Bible says be sober. That means that you are still aware of what's happening. But the moment you lose discernment of what's happening around you, you've gone way too far. Because when Jesus, remember his first miracle, he turned water into, and it wasn't metaphorical wine. Oh, here's Pastor Jeff. How are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> it was real wine, right? But I'm going I'm to uh, take, take you back. This is, this, is, this is what I know. It offends some people, right? So when I was growing up, I had both my, well, I still have my ears pierced. I don't wear earrings anymore. And if you saw on Facebook, somebody posted a photo of me with my earrings and my hair. All right. So I worked at Red Lobster for five years, and sometimes I worked the morning shift. And every time I worked the morning shift, it's like my tips were really low. And I always gave exceptional service because I'm an exceptional server, right? <laughs> but uh, the clientele was a little bit older. A lot of them were more retired. And uh, I just couldn't figure out what was going on until one day, uh, one of my, the guests had stopped me. And he goes, young man, he goes, you are an exceptional young man. Like he says, you speak very well. You're well, you're well mannered. He's like, I got a question for you. He goes, why do you wear those earrings? And I said, back streets, back, all right. <laughs> now I was just telling him it's just part of our culture. And, you know, he goes, you know what? I don't think you need those. So I remember I was offended. And then after that day, I thought, you know what? Is that what's holding up this, the tips? Is me wearing earrings? So, you know, I took them off. And then after that, kid you not, my, my tips went from here to here. And I was just clean cut and presentable. And that, but, but then when I went to smoking section, if I put on the earrings, my tips were like really high, right? <laughs> but here's the, here's the thought I had. If I wear earrings, I'll offend some. If I don't wear earrings, I offend no one. So when it comes to drinking, if I drink, it'll offend some and it'll cause some to stumble. But if I don't drink, it offends nobody and nobody stumbles. So... That's the conviction I have for myself, and it's for our pastors as well. And, um, and I'm not saying that you have to have and hold that same conviction. In fact, if you, if you drink alcohol in front of me, I am not going to say, come out of there, I rebuke that, that, that wine sipper spirit in you in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to say that. In fact, I'm not offended by it. Uh, and let me, just two scriptures just to write down, Romans 14 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Romans 14 says, if somebody in there is, is weaker in the faith or and it causes them to stumble, whether it be food or drink, don't do it in front of them. And here, here's something that's so interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if you look at that, uh, this is talking about meat sacrificed uh, uh, for idol worship. And so here's what people were doing. In a pagan society, people were taking the best meats taking it to these pagan temples, and there was some like demonic influence, and it was being consecrated for that particular work. And then the priests of those pagan temples would then turn around and sell the meat to the people. And how many know that like, when, when you bring things to the temple, it's going to be the best of the best of the best? Like this is the filet mignons right here. So what they would do is they just turn around and sell it. After they'd wash it, they would sell it. Now, there are believers who are mature knows that meat's just meat. We serve the Lord. We're not serving anything that this meat is being consecrated for. And we bind it and we pray over it and they ate it. Unfortunately, there are some people who it was, a, it was a stumbling block for them because they came out of that. And the fact that you ate it means that, hey, maybe I should just go back because there's demonic influence there saying, hey, your leader or your friend who is a believer is eating that. You should go back there, too. And so it caused people to stumble. So what is he saying? He says, 
even though you have the right to do everything, you shouldn't do everything. Be aware of who's around. And if, if you do something to cause somebody to stumble, he says, don't do that. Don't stop the work of God. And so that's what our stance is, is depending upon who you are will determine what it is that person will do around you. And it's not a sin to drink. And let me say this, it's not a sin to eat meat. Amen, Darnell, all the vegans. I'm just kidding. I won't eat meat in front of them because I don't want them to stumble either. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, I got to get with it and to it. Let me just say about temptation. Uh, just very quickly, there are three categories in which we are all tempted. I'll read it to you. 1 John 2, verse 15 through 16. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, say it with me, is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it is of the world. Every single thing that we're tempted with can be, or tempted by, can be in, uh, under these, uh, put uh, under, arranged under these three different categories. So here's why this is so important that you know this, is anybody who sins or who falls in temptation, I, I, I really am not hard on them. I am in, in a sense that I love them, and I'm like, hey, you shouldn't have done that, man. But I gently restore them. And I don't condemn them. Why? Because all of the things that we sin against and all the temptations that we might fall, all fall under the same category. It's kind of like guys, uh, people who eat lechon. You know what lechon is? It's like a big pig uh, roasted, and it's, it's still alive. And no, it's not alive. Yeah. Finish reading Charlotte's Web. And then we're going to... And for me, I just can't do it. Like, I feel like the pig is looking at me and saying, oh, why are, you, why are you picking up my skin? Don't do that, you know. But wouldn't it be, it would be hypocritical of me to condemn somebody who eats lechon, and then I turn around and eat bacon. The thing is, it's the same, just packaged differently. All sin is the same, just packaged differently under those three categories. Let me, let me, let me show you. Uh, remember, it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All right, I'm going to show you how Jesus was tempted. Notice this. The first is, he says, turn the, uh, the stones into bread. And what do you do with bread? You eat it. You know what that is? It's called lust of the flesh. Then he was brought up to the highest point of the temple. And it says, jump off to prove that you're the son of God. You know what that is? That's called the lust of the eyes, to be able to see out and look out. The third one is the kingdoms I give you to worship. Take them to the high point. It says, if you just bow down and worship me, that's called the pride of life. Tempting him with all three. But that's his MO because he did it before. In Genesis chapter 3, when he deceived Eve, he said to her, she, they saw that the tree produced fruit and was good for food. What do you do with food? That's called lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And it says it's a desire to make one wise. What's that called? Pride of life. So here's the thing. Satan can't make you take the bite. Sure can't make it look good, though. But he doesn't tell you that you'll get kicked out of the garden, that you'll experience labor pains, that you'll have to sweat to eat, and that your son will kill your son. So here's the good news. Not only does... God cannot tempt. He does test. Satan tempts. But the good news is because of Jesus Christ, you can overcome. Amen? Just close with this last point, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Listen, all sin is common to man. There's nothing that's exceptional. All fall under those three categories. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Uh, I want you to see two promises here, the great promises. Number one is God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And number two, he'll always make a way of escape. Here's what I love that. That says that our God is a God of ex exits. That means I can never get stuck. Even if I look stuck, I'm not stuck because our God's a God of exits. If he's got to part the Red Sea, he'll part the Red Sea. If he's got to unlock and open a door, then he'll unlock and open a door. If our God has to make a way, even when there's no way, he'll make a way because he is the way. If I seem like I'm going to get shackled in chains, that's what the enemy is trying to tell me. But God says that I am free and who the sun sets free is free indeed. He makes a way of escape. 
So here's just some very practical, just, uh, I'm just going to list it for you, very practical things that you can do to overcome temptation. Not only does God make a way of escape, here's what you do. You always look for the exit. Boom, boom. It's there. It's clear and visible, right? If you look, there's always a way of escape. Here's what you should do. Number one, spend time daily with the Lord. Acknowledge him throughout the day. And just this last week, I had lunch with Pastor Joe. We went to Golden Corral. With, I met, um, met another individual there. And on the way back, in 15 minutes, we were just riding the car together. He sang the same song four times. Blessed be the name. Like, so he acknowledged God and he ignored me for 15 minutes, right? But what's he doing? He's spending time with the Lord. The second, meditate on his word day and night. Now, I want you to consider what Jesus did. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. How many know if you fast for 40 days and 40 nights, you'll be very hungry? Have you ever been so hungry to the point you were, it was like your breaking point, like you were going to start crying? You know, and my wife, uh, she's been on this uh, health journey these last uh, c- c- few months, and she's dropped 23 pounds, and she's just trying to get healthier. And I'm so proud of her, I really am. I tell her if she was 20 pounds heavier, which she was, I said, I'd still love you, 20 pounds, 40, 50. If you're 200, 300 pounds, I'd still love you, right? And you'll still be beautiful no matter what. Um, but she had this moment where she had a breaking. There's a breaking point where, because she's on a restricted diet, the doctor says she's going to eat this. And uh, so she just looked at me, and she's like, I don't want to eat this anymore. I want Wingstop and fried chicken and pizza and all the stuff she wanted to eat, right? Because she was so hungry. My daughter and my son, we were, we were working, we were letting them kind of follow more closer to her and my, uh, what we eat. And uh, there's a point with my daughter, I put Chick-fil-A grilled nuggets in front of her. And she looked at me, she's like, why, daddy? I don't want grilled nuggets again. Why do we have to keep eating this? And she's like crying, and I'm like, hey, it's Chick-fil-A. It's the best. Like, eat it. It's good for you. And she said she wanted something else because she was so hungry. Now, I want you to notice it's not like Jesus wasn't hungry. When he says, turn this bread to stone, or turn these stones to bread, notice Jesus didn't say, I'm not hungry. He didn't say, I'm not hungry. What did he say? It is written. So what is he doing? He combats it with the word. He's not allowing how he feels to override what God has said. So what you should you do? Meditate on his word day and night throughout the day. Let a scripture that dropped in your heart, bring it back up and you allow it to chew it, meditate on it and then bring it back in. And throughout the day, just keep regurgitating and bring it back up. It sounds gross, but it makes sense. Second, spend time with those who strengthen you. If you're struggling with somebody, the question is, who else besides you knows what you're struggling with? There should be somebody who walks alongside with you to help you, to be accountable. So if you if you struggle with going to certain restaurants because you overeat, there should be somebody who knows where you're going to go eat at. They say, are you sure you want to eat at Golden Corral? Because that's a buffet like you will overeat for sure. Right. Just have somebody in your life who would tell you, hey, listen, no, like you can't you can't go there. Okay. You can do unlimited salad at, at Olive Garden, but no breadsticks. Number two, four, we just talked about it before. Use wisdom. Some things are just wisdom. Don't put yourself in the situation. Uh, number f- uh, five, learn to say no. And number six, continually pray. So Jesus said, pray, lest, because lest, lest your, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. So what does he say? Just pray. Amen? Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, Father, we thank you. So incomprehensible that we don't understand it fully. In your grace, we don't understand fully. In your mercy, we don't understand fully. But, Father, yet your grace is shed abroad, is put on our hearts. Your love is shed abroad on our hearts. And, Father, you just, your, your own word says you love the entire world. And so, Father, I pray right now for every heart who's here, anybody feels condemned or feels like you don't love them or care for them, Uh, Father, I pray that you begin to touch their heart and you soften their heart right now. And so, Father, we thank you. We ask that right now in the name of Jesus. If there's anybody here today who has never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you want to make that decision today, just so I know who I'm praying with, go and slip your hand right where you are before we close in prayer. If you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you want to make that decision today, we'll pray together. All right, with every, every hand on your heart, We'll say this confession of prayer in faith. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. You know everything about me. You know my sin, my mistakes, my shame, my shortcomings. 
but yet you love me anyways. So Jesus, forgive me my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior, and I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we put our hands together and let's give God praise, our best praise today. Amen. I'm just going to invite you at this time to stand to your feet. Our worship team is going to lead us in a song of worship. And here's just what I want to ask for you. During your time when you're worshiping, I know God can speak. And if there's an area in your life where you know that the enemy just seems to got you, his hook, line, and sinker, like he gets you every time, I want you just to begin just to confess and ask God to forgive you for falling into that temptation, but also to give you the power and the strength to overcome it. And as you're worshiping, that the Lord would bring up somebody that in your remembrance or in your mind who can walk with you and help restore you gently. Amen. Can we do that? Let's go and lift up our hands. So worship team leads us in a song. Oh, oh, oh. 